Well, thanks everybody for being here. Uh, thanks for, for sticking it out. I'm so excited to be here in person. This is a great uh, event after so many years of doing virtual events. So um, I'm here today to talk about the topic of opioid addiction and Civil War veterans. And so uh, to kind of launch into today's talk, uh, I'll set the stage. And I'll set that kind of by saying that in the wake of the Civil War, there were tens of thousands of Civil War veterans that struggled with addiction to opium and morphine, which are drugs that sound familiar to us today in the context of the opioid crisis. Uh, these men, these Civil War veterans, in so many cases, trace their addiction right back to the Civil War, to the Civil War's healthcare practices and its medical uh, conditions. If you can believe it, opioids were everywhere in the Civil War. They were in the field hospitals that were kind of set off on the edge of battlefield sites where you would go and be triaged. They were also around the campfires where men would huddle to keep warm at night. And they were especially in the surgical wards of the Civil War's massive hospitals where the severely wounded would go and spend multiple months at a time recovering from things like amputation. And so in these places, Civil War surgeons gave opioids for practically everything, a huge range uh, of different ailments, things from the typical things that we might imagine when we think about Civil War medicine, like gunshot wounds and amputations, but also some of the more like run-of-the-mill conditions that a couple of speakers today have hinted at, like diarrhea and dysentery. We're going to talk a lot about diarrhea today. It's a good thing that this is after lunch. Uh, I usually, when I teach, it's right before lunch, so my students are always kind of squeamish. Um, so anyways, uh, opioid addiction for these tens of thousands of, of addicted Civil War veterans was basically an unintended consequence of Civil War medicine, and it snowballed into uh, an epidemic, a true epidemic that was America's first opioid uh, crisis. Now what I want to talk about today is how people lived through and sometimes didn't live through that opioid crisis, and I think what's striking for me is the, the sheer number of ways that Civil War soldiers who went on to become Civil War veterans and, and addicted Civil War veterans suffered for a really, really long time after the Civil War, which was kind of the defining experience for, for a lot of their lives. Um, their suffering after the war is actually a really unique window into the broader legacies of, of what it meant for people to be a Civil War veteran. And so that, for me, is what drew me to this topic of, of opioid addiction and see kind of what life was like for Civil War soldiers after war. Um, and that's especially true of the long-term health consequences of military service that stuck with you, um, oftentimes kind of on your body after you took off your uniform and stacked your, your rifle musket for the last time in 1865. Now, the story uh, that I tell in my book, which I'm hoping will be out in the next uh, calendar year, um, so stay tuned, tuned on that, the story is a big story. It's got lots of twists and turns. And I find that sometimes it's easy to get lost in the weeds when you tell it from the bird's eye view, from that 40,000 foot view. So what I want to do today is to bring this story home to Virginia. I want to tell it as a Virginia story uh, and as the story of one particular family uh, in particular. And those are the Gulricks of Fredericksburg, Virginia. So not too far from Richmond. And they're going to act as our guides, illuminating different facets about the, the post-Civil War opioid epidemic. And they're also going to teach us a lot about the ultimate fate of the people who lived through the Civil War after 1865. So these are our protagonists. This is John and Francis. Uh, John and Francis Gulrick. Again, they're a married couple living in Fredericksburg, Virginia, for most of their, of their lives. Excuse me. So these are photos taken of the Gulricks around 1920. I mean, as we can kind of see in the photos, the Gulricks were uh, prominent socialites in the Northern Virginia area in the Fredericksburg uh, social scene, where they were fixtures of kind of high society life from basically the, the Civil War until their deaths in the 1920s. So that's a multiple decade span of time after the Civil War. And in so many ways, actually, the Gulricks represent a microcosm of the whole Civil War era, not just uh, the opioid crisis that's the main focus for me today. Uh, to give you an example, both came from slaveholding families. 
Uh, John was also a first-generation Irish immigrant, so he uh, illustrates the huge rush of people that flooded into the United States during this time period. Uh, as a teenager, John became a Confederate enlistee, and I'll speak about that in just a moment. And then after the war, uh, in the time that he took this photo, he, was, uh, he became a, a lawyer in Fredericksburg and then even a local city judge. Later on, uh, as an elderly Confederate veteran, like so many other uh, Confederate veterans, kind of his station and his class, John became a notable speaker and writer on uh, the Virginia kind of lost cause circuit. So here in this lovely photo, one of my favorite photos uh, from my research, this is John pictured in the early 1920s. In 1921, 22, 23, the U.S. Marines actually reenacted uh, multiple times the Battle of the Wilderness in 1864. And at the end of these reenactments, they would kind of bring out the old veterans to give talks. And so here we have John shaking hands with the president at that time, who's Warren G. Harding. That gives you kind of an idea of his local uh, stature as uh, kind of a celebrity Civil War veteran. By the way, he also published several, several um, books about different facets of history. So you can read these on Google Books if you're curious to learn uh, from John and his experiences. Now for her part, Frances Gulrick, or Fanny, um, which was her preferred nickname, she was also a local celebrity for her work on historical statues, which is obviously one of the big things uh, about the Civil War era that modern American society is kind of uh, having a, a cultural conversation with. So she was right in the center of that uh, back in the 1890s. In fact, she served as the president of Fredericksburg's uh, local United Daughters of the Confederacy chapter. And if you've ever been out to Fredericksburg, you may or may not have seen this obelisk. Has anybody seen it? Yeah, a couple. Okay, great, awesome. Uh, so this is, those of you who, who have seen it, this is the Mary Washington Monument uh, in Fredericksburg. And Fanny and her UDC chapter were responsible for raising the funds that were used to put that up. The catch, though, is that, that the John and Fanny Gulrick that we see here in these portraits were, um, by outward appearances, by all accounts, kind of the hallmark of elite white Virginia society in the post-Civil War era. They were well-to-do. John was successful in business and civic life, politics. Uh, Fanny was successful in high society. And if you looked up you know, well-adjusted survivors of the Civil War in the dictionary, I mean, you'd find John and Fanny Gulrick. They were the ideal that so many people from their background aspired to be after the Civil War. And until very recently, I should add that this is what most historians thought of when they thought of Civil War veterans, right? These old photos of, of veterans who have kind of successfully recovered and, and moved on and put the war behind them. However, that said, appearances can be deceiving because there was a lot more to the Gulricks than meets the eye when you look at these photos. John and Fanny had a dark secret, and that is uh, a secret that they took extreme measures to keep behind uh, a veil, keep it in the family, don't let the rest of the world know. And that secret is that John was severely addicted to morphine. To use the phrasing of the day, and this is where the title of my uh, uh, upcoming book comes from, uh, John was enslaved to the drug morphine, the, a Civil War era way of saying addicted. Um, and ultimately, fast forward in time to the 1920s, and what we can see in the Gulrick's experience is that, is that morphine addiction or morphine slavery came to dominate every facet of John's post-Civil War life. In fact, even his marriage, Fanny, ended up hating John because of his uh, addiction, which ended up tearing the Gulrick uh, family apart in a series of dramatic events in 1896. So again, the, the Gulricks that we see here in these kind of smiling black and white photos are living a kind of double life, a life of success on the one hand for the outside world to see, but behind closed doors, uh, in secret, a life of addiction. It looks very different than what they chose to show the world. So how did this happen to the Gulricks? Uh, how did it come to this? And how did the Civil War spiral into uh, an unpredicted opioid crisis? What I want to do first is kind of set the stage for John and Fanny's uh, struggles by showing basically how the war triggered an epidemic of addiction for veterans like John. And so we're going to begin by zooming in on a particular moment in time, and that's the 1860s, the Civil War years itself. 
to explore the origins of this opioid epidemic that affected veterans, and then we're gonna jump forward in time about 30 years to the 1890s when John and Fanny's marriage fell apart. So like all Virginians of the Civil War generation, the Gulrick's lives were totally shaped uh, by their experiences during the war, which upended their worlds. Um, as teenagers, John and Fanny lived through the Battle of Fredericksburg in December of 1862, and so when federal troops uh, descended on Fredericksburg, kind of determined to cross the Rappahannock and to storm the Confederate lines at, at Mary's Heights, kind of put yourself, uh, imagine yourself there, uh, John and Fanny are literally caught in the crossfire of this battle. Now, most white residents fled the town when Union troops showed up on the other side of the river, but for some reason, Fanny and her uh, parents made the decision to stay behind, so they hunkered down in their basement. Uh, during the battle, their house, which was on Charles Street in Fredericksburg, if, if you know where that is, uh, it was completely obliterated, destroyed by cannon shot and gunfire. So here we see one of the Civil War's most iconic photos. This is what Fanny's house looked like uh, after the Battle of uh, Fredericksburg. So all that is to say that Fanny and her family became war refugees, like so many other civilians during the Civil War. Now, for his part, John also witnessed the carnage uh, of the battle. Uh, he was actually too young to fight in it, though, so he was there as a civilian as well. Um, but the scene, this scene, was fresh in his mind a few months later, when in May of 1864, at about the age of, of 18 or 19, uh, it's unclear when exactly he was born, but that's the age range that we're talking about, he enlisted in the local uh, artillery outfit, which was called the Fredericksburg Artillery. And at this point, late in the war, about 70% of Virginia's white males are already in the Confederate military. So John is one of those replacement soldiers that are plugged into units to kind of fill the gaps. Um, the Fredericksburg artillery needed replacement because it had been in the thick of the Eastern theater throughout the war. Uh, before John enlisted, the, the outfit had seen action at the Peninsula Campaign in 1862, at Second Manassas, at Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, the Wilderness, Spotsylvania Courthouse, I mean, you name it, they were there. Uh, and so all the highlights of the Eastern Theater. And after John enlisted in 1864, the war only got bloodier. Foreshadow kind of where we're going. Uh, the artillery, the Fredericksburg artillery, went on to fight at Cold Harbor and then the Siege of Petersburg. And John and a few dozen survivors from the artillery uh, were present at Lee's surrender at Appomattox in 1865. Like many veterans, John's trouble with morphine began with a bullet wound that he sustained at Petersburg here. Uh, John was shot in the left thigh, so about here, while defending the Confederate position seen in the photograph, which is a place called Fort Harrison. It was a key segment in Lee's um, vast defensive network around Richmond. And in September of 1864, federal troops stormed the fort. They were determined to, to cross the fortifications that we see here and take this position. Uh, predictably, they completely overran John and the surviving members of the Fredericksburg artillery. Now, somehow John managed to survive the, the mayhem, which turned into hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, and from, from what I can tell, after he was wounded, his comrades dragged him back behind the lines as they retreated to a Confederate field hospital set just behind uh, the siege fortification per perimeter. At the field hospital, which would have looked like the image in the upper left-hand corner, Surgeons somehow managed to stop the bleeding from John's thigh wound and bandage up uh, his leg. So he was ostensibly one of the lucky ones, but he didn't get better. Although Lee was at this point absolutely desperate for men, even wounded ones like John, he was simply too injured for the surgeons to justify sending him back to the front lines. And so instead they sent him back into Richmond itself here uh, to be treated at Chimborazo, which is this massive 8,000-bed Confederate hospital by 1864 and 65. This was one of the continent's biggest hospitals, to put it in perspective. And at one of these two hospitals, maybe the field hospital or maybe Chimborazo, John was first introduced to morphine, the thing that would change his life. Um, despite the Union blockade, it might surprise you to learn, and I'll say that it surprised me to learn, Hospitals in this particular part of Virginia still actually did have morphine, which was running pretty scarce in other parts of the Confederacy. During the siege of, of Petersburg, where John was shot, 
Uh, to give you an example, 40% of the prescriptions at the second North Carolina Infantry's field hospital contained opiates. So these are drugs that, despite the blockade, are still flowing pretty freely where John happens to be hospitalized. And he spent about a month in the hospital at Chimborazo, and of course the odds are that Confederate surgeons would have given him repeated doses of morphine to manage the pain while his body fought off infection before he could return to the front. Now for me, this is where the story gets really interesting. Uh, the Civil War was, to put what I'm about to say in, in a perspective, the Civil War was a massive public health crisis. It was actually the biggest health crisis in American history up to that point. And so there were millions of other men uh, like John in his shoes. To put a number on it, the war caused just over 1.5 million recorded casualties. These are just the ones that were uh, sick and injured enough to actually go to the hospital. Uh, out of about three million men. So the odds are 50-50 that you would have been uh, experiencing the kind of thing that John goes through. And in fact, considering how diverse Civil War soldiers were, some white, some black, some rich, some poor, uh, some Republicans, some Democrats, I think sickness for me is really one of the few common experiences that soldiers actually shared in the Civil War. So that's worth, worth talking about maybe in the Q&A. Um, all that is to say that American doctors had never seen such an influx of really sick, really injured patients. And so to deal with this unprecedented medical crisis, basically doctors had to double down on the most basics of medical care that they had available to them, which were, like today, prescription opioids. Now, doctors have been using opiates or, or opioids, the term is somewhat interchangeable, for thousands and thousands of years. These are, in fact, humanity's oldest painkillers uh, and some of our most effective uh, painkillers still today. When the Civil War broke out in 1861, opium and its derivative medicines, which included morphine and also a drug called laudanum, which is basically morphine distilled in alcohol. Um, so you can imagine how powerful and potent that drug was. These are in somewhere between 50 and 80 percent of all prescriptions written in the United States. So these medicines truly are everywhere. They're the equivalent to taking an aspirin today. Um, there's a good reason for this, in fact. This might sound jarring to us, but these are actually really useful medicines before uh, modern medical care became uh, available. Opium has a lot of upsides. It comes from a plant, so it's pretty easy to grow and, and access. Uh, in fact, the Confederacy in 1863 tried to convince uh, the women of the Confederacy to start growing opium in their gardens. Uh, that fizzled out, but if you ever are browsing through Confederate newspapers, you might see a call to Confederate women to supply the Confederacy with opium poppies. Uh, you could grow the opium and you could harvest the plant and then give it directly as a powder that you could take from the opium poppy itself. You could inject it as liquid morphine, or you could mix it with an infinite number of other plants to make uh, different kinds of pills. Uh, and actually, I should add that the Civil War popularized the hypodermic uh, needle, which we see here. This is an early Civil War era hypodermic needle kit. And I'm happy to talk more about this device in the Q&A. Fun fact, instead of being, uh, in, you know, today's hypodermic syringes, you squeeze them and you push the morphine through. These were actually, they, they operated with a screw. So you would screw them instead of push them. Fun fact. Um, these are actual Civil War prescriptions that contained opiates, so you can see the underlines in red. Uh, today, prescriptions, most pres prescriptions are digital. Um, back then, prescriptions were scribbled on slips of paper. Sometimes surgeons kept a notebook where they would record what medicines they were dispensing. So for me, these have been invaluable sources. I will say that uh, doctors obviously are famous for having bad handwriting, and busy Civil War surgeons were the same. But not only that, these are in Latin as well. So I've had to brush up on my Latin a little bit. Um, but these records, what they tell us is that Civil War surgeons used opium and morphine for, again, practically everything. For example, dysentery, and my favorite of all, the Civil War ailments, chronic diarrhea. These were probably the most common ailments uh, of the Civil War. And pulverized opium, opium that had been kind of crushed up in a mortar and pestle, was the main remedy. Um, actually, Pete mentioned the database Private Voices, and so I went in uh, to Private Voices and typed in uh, chronic diarrhea, and I wanted to know how many different ways that people described this. I found a fun quote from a Georgia soldier in 1862 who said that our boys are all well except bad colds and the backdoor trunks, right? So diarrhea was ubiquitous during, during the Civil War, as gross as that sounds. 
Now, the way that opium um, helped Civil War soldiers to, to recover and to stay in the field is that opium causes constipation, or as doctors back then like to describe it, corks up the bowel. Uh, so it was a godsend for soldiers that had the backdoor trots. Surgeons also gave hypodermic morphine shots and morphine and opium pills to treat the pain from gunshot wounds like the one that John had, and obviously these gunshot wounds, as, as we all know, oftentimes result in amputations. Now, you might be wondering at this point, if they're giving out opium and morphine kind of like candy, did doctors, did surgeons know that opioids were addictive? Now, I have to admit that when I started this research, I didn't think that they would have known uh, about the addictive properties of opium, but I was gobsmacked to learn that they did know that opioids were addictive. Um, American doctors knew going into the war that opiates were addictive when you use them over the course of several weeks, which is what, if you have endured an amputation, you're gonna be taking uh, opium in that pattern. It took months to heal from a gunshot wound, or an amputation, and many men actually never fully recovered, so they were in pain for the rest of their lives. Now, surgeons, again, going into the war, they knew that when men would take morphine or, or opium under these conditions, they were probably gonna get addicted. This had been widely covered in antebellum American medical journals. It was even published in newspapers like the New York Times in the 1850s. But the simple fact is that the Civil War's health crisis was so huge that doctors had no alternatives. These medicines were really, really important if surgeons were gonna patch soldiers like John up and send them back to the front. Uh, a Confederate Army medical handbook actually put it like this, and this is a quote that's always stuck with me. Opium is the one indispensable drug on the battlefield, important to the surgeon as gunpowder to the ordnance. And I think any soldier in the Civil War would have understood that metaphor. Unsurprisingly, Countless Civil War veterans like John Gulrick ended up becoming addicted to opiates. Uh, some men actually became addicted during the war itself in hospitals like Chimborazo, again, where John was treated for his gunshot wound uh, after or during the Battle of uh, the Siege of Petersburg. Other veterans developed addictions upon returning home through self-medication, uh, through treating their own uh, medical conditions. In fact, there were no regulations really of any kind on opioids until the early 20th century. The first major federal drug law uh, came as late as 1914. So these are kind of free-flowing drugs in general. So when veterans came home from the war, oftentimes they could go to the general store or find uh, a traveling doctor and simply purchase opioids for themselves. Now, to me, it's not clear exactly which of these circumstances John fell into. Um, but considering the nature of his wound, he probably became addicted very early on. If we can imagine, every time uh, John Gulrick planted his left foot, it would have sent a tinge of pain up his thigh, right? So it's a very painful condition. Probably he got addicted pretty early on through treating his pain or maybe through a, a doctor's prescription. However, it's worth mentioning that not all veterans were equally likely to get addicted. Um, John was in the most likely category of, of them all to get addicted because he was a white veteran. Um, black veterans were far less likely to get uh, addicted to opioids, and that is because they were less likely to receive painkillers in the first place. And if you're familiar with some of the reporting that's come out of today's opioid crisis, this is a kind of a familiar parallel. Uh, the prevailing medical idea of the 19th century claimed that black uh, Americans were unable to actually feel the sensation of pain. And this sounds really jarring to us, uh, but this is a racial disparity that's evident in 19th century medicine, and it's reflected in the post-war veterans' addiction patterns. But even with that said, during the post-war decades, so in the late 1860s, the 70s, the 80s, and even into the 90s, uh, it was still obvious that lots and lots of Civil War veterans like John had become uh, addicted. And so this problem started raising real alarm bells. You can find traces of it in newspapers. You can find it in government medical reports. You can find it in medical journals. Even the records of jails and mental asylums um, kind of exude cases of Civil War veterans who've gotten addicted to morphine. In Virginia, which is John and Fanny's, uh, again, their home state, the addiction crisis was especially severe. So I work uh, out in the Shenandoah Valley now, so I did not intend for this to happen when I set up on this book project, but Stanton is about 30 minutes north uh, of VMI. So for me, this is kind of my home, home turf. Uh, in 1878, which is about 15 years out of the Civil War, 
the New York Times ran uh, a story on the opioid crisis in the Shenandoah Valley, which had been devastated during the war, and it was still home to many Civil War survivors, people like John and Fanny. Uh, according to the paper, it is deplorable, quote, to observe how the evil of addiction has increased in the valley, the, the Times reported. Um, opiate addiction actually seemed contagious, according to the, the New York Times, drawing these really implicit comparisons to actual epidemic diseases like cholera and smallpox, which seemed to kind of spread from person to person. According to the paper, one man sees another using the terrible drug, and before he is aware of it, he too himself is eating opium. The evil of opiate addiction, again echoing the times here, is like an epidemic. It is in the atmosphere. And it, actually, the Times went so far as to label Stanton, which is one of the Valley's major towns at that point, and that's what we see here in the lithograph. They labeled it the great opium city of this part of the country. Uh, one pharmacist, in fact, in a Stanton pharmacy claimed to have sold 79,000 individual doses of morphine in the preceding 12 months. Uh, that's a lot of morphine for a town that's got only about 6,600 people. That gives us a scale, uh, a kind of gauge of the scale of the addiction crisis. The state of Virginia got worried. Uh, the state of Virginia wasn't uh, oblivious to this. And they were so worried, in fact, that they even created and, and opened a hospital here in Richmond uh, for what they called the reclamation of opium eaters. An opium eater is a, a 19th century term for uh, addiction. Um, soon, all over the nation, there were dozens of similar facilities that, that were opened by state governments, and these were essentially the United States' first rehabs. They were designed in part to treat Civil War veterans like John, uh, and they were funded with uh, taxpayer dollars. I think that's worth mentioning as well. You could also be committed to a mental asylum for your addiction. Stanton also happens to be home to one of Virginia's three uh, psychiatric facilities in the Civil War era. It was called the Western Lunatic Asylum, and facilities like the Western uh, Asylum took in scores of cases of addicted veterans like John. And remember this uh, asylum, because uh, we're going to return to this. So I, I will add, though, that um, we've been focused on Virginia so far, but by no means, again, is this limited to Virginia. Uh, it is a national crisis affecting both Northerners and Southerners, Easterners, Westerners, everybody who's, who... Uh, lots and lots of, of veterans from, from all over the country. Um, to give you an example, in 1872, just a, a few years after the Civil War, a Boston pharmacist wrote to the, the State Board of Health, so he's reporting this crisis to the authorities, and he wrote that, quote, veteran soldiers as a class are addicted to opiates. This was something that became linked to Civil War veterans in the popular mind. Uh, another Massachusetts doctor put it like this, among the veterans of the war, a very large number are still suffering from chronic diarrhea, and as might be expected, some have become opium eaters. So the public was clear, uh, at least some members of the public were clear on this emerging epidemic. They saw it and they reacted to it. The situation went on like this for decades, and when I, see de when I say decades, I really do mean decades. Uh, in the war's immediate aftermath, you saw a spike of overdose deaths. So if you look in newspapers from the, 18, the late 1860s, you might find obituaries where men have died of morphine overdoses. I found plenty of those. But what I was really surprised to find was veterans who lived with opioid uh, addiction, veterans like John, for you know, sometimes 30, 40, even 50 plus years after the Civil War. To give you one example, there was a Union infantryman named Perry Bowser, uh, which kind of reminds me of Mario Brothers. That's why I like to, to talk about this case, Bowser. He became addicted to morphine in a Vicksburg Army Hospital in 1864. And so uh, I found an anecdote about that. And so I went to pull his pension file. And he describes in detail how at Vicksburg, surgeons gave him morphine. He kept on taking it ever since then. Now, I was curious to find out what happened to Bowser, how long he lived. And so I started pulling the records from various soldiers' homes uh, after the war, which, for, for uh, you know, reference, these are the precursors to the modern VA system. And what I discovered was that Perry Bowser ended up in a soldier's home in Indiana. Uh, he was admitted to a soldier's home where he died in 1915 of chronic morphinism. So again, this is a guy who gets addicted as a teenager and spends two-thirds of his life addicted to morphine. It was a long-term crisis. And I think for me, as a medical historian and a Civil War historian, this is one of the big payoffs. Like it shows us 
Uh, the long-term nature of addiction teaches us that the Civil War's health crisis didn't just go away in the 1860s. It stretched on and on and on until the last Civil War veterans died in the 1920s. Anyways, back to John and Fanny. This is how the Civil War's health crisis spawned an epidemic of drug addiction. Uh, this is the backdrop in which John and Fanny find themselves. Um, but what did addiction actually look like for them in their day-to-day -day lives and, and for other veterans? Like, what did it cost them? What did it mean to people? To answer these questions, we're going to jump forward about 30 years in time to 1896, which is the dramatic year in John and Fanny Gulrich's life and marriage. Um, as John and Fanny learned the hard way, the costs of addiction were twofold. On the one hand, addiction was a medical condition that had life-threatening consequences, including overdose. Uh, but at, on the other hand, addiction was also really stigmatized back then. Um, it detracted from a person's identity, from their standing in the community. And so in other words, opiate addiction was both a medical crisis and a cultural or a social crisis. And that's the way that it looked in John and, and Fanny's lives. Uh, to give you an example, take the idea of dependency, the idea of being dependent on something besides yourself. Now, addicted veterans like John uh, to, to keep themselves out of opioid withdrawal, which is an immensely excruciating process that can actually kill you. Uh, in, uh, addicted veterans like John needed to either swallow or inject opioids multiple times a day sometimes. So they were dependent on the drug's function. They couldn't do anything without morphine. They couldn't eat, they couldn't sleep, they couldn't focus. They were truly dependent on the drug. The catch, though, is that during the Civil War era, think about the ideas about Victorian culture. One of the prized uh, facets of a, of, a, of a really good person, according to um, Civil War era culture, was that men like John were supposed to be self-controlled. They weren't supposed to be dependent on something besides themselves. They were supposed to be able to decide, you know, to make a decision and to follow through with that decision. For example, to quit morphine. Um, but Civil War veterans who were addicted like John were not able to do that. In fact, this is why they described themselves as slaves to opium. That metaphor made sense to them. Uh, one other veteran, a guy from the first Texas, not the second Texas, a guy named Byron McKean, described himself as, quote, a slave to that miserable opium. And by that, he meant that he was utterly dependent on the drug in a way that defied social expectations. Think also about ideas about pain relief. Opioids, of course, are painkillers. Uh, and again, ideas, as I mentioned a minute ago, about pain back then are way different than ideas that we have about pain uh, today. According to Civil War era medicine, not everyone was supposed to actually need painkillers, which sounds bonkers to us, right? If you have your leg amputated, of course you're gonna be in pain. Um, but the ways that they thought about pain in the Civil War era were, were different. They actually believed, doctors believed that only um, the bodies of white women in particular were physically sensitive enough to actually need painkillers for the long term. Uh, men were supposed to have a dose of ether, maybe some chloroform or a dose or two of morphine, but then they were supposed to grit their teeth and kind of tough it out. So when Civil War veterans reached for that morphine bottle day after day after day, it made them look weak. It made them look feminine in a way that they did not want the rest of the world to see them. Think also about, the, again, the physical effects of opioid addiction. Uh, addiction destroyed veterans' bodies and, and their health as well. It had really serious physical consequences such as impotence, uh, fatigue, but also weight loss. And for me, this is a really striking example of what opium could do to these Civil War veterans. People who take opioids for long periods of time suffer from extreme weight loss. Uh, and you can see this in the medical records of Civil War veterans like John. Some veterans lost 50 pounds or more, and they literally appealed, uh, excuse me, appear, appeared skeletal in the eyes of their wives and their families and government pension officials. Uh, one addicted man described his, him, himself like this. He wrote, my physical manhood is a wreck, a shell, because of morphine addiction. Um, think about kind of the ideal, uh, think about some of the, the lithographs that you might have seen of the late 19th century. This is the time when bodybuilding is really becoming a thing in American culture. So after the Civil War, the kind of idealized male body image is supposed to be somebody that looks like Teddy Roosevelt. These like kind of big, strong guys, like the guy over here, on the left, which is an image that I pulled out of a life insurance manual. So this uh, picture is literally described as the ideal, the perfect male specimen of the, the 1890s. But on the right over here, this is what most Civil War veterans who abused opioids for you know, a long time, years, 
ended up looking like, emaciated. It was visibly obvious to folks that there was something off uh, about them. Okay. Um, let's see. So when you add all of this up, addiction creates a tremendously stressful situation for families like the Gulricks, between the fatigue and the impotence and the weight loss and you know, so on and so forth. Basically, addiction is destined for Civil War veterans who are unable to quit, which is most of them. It's destined to end in a crisis, a big blow up between veterans and their families, and that's exactly what happened to Fanny and John Gulrick in 1896. So we'll jump forward in time to them. Uh, by this point, John is in dire straits. Years of morphine addiction has left him physically broken. He's unable to focus. He has a lack of energy. He loses his law practice and thus his ability to bring in money to support the family, so they are now impoverished. He's in bad health. He's on the verge of death. And maybe even worse, kind of in elite uh, Virginia society, he's lost his, his sense of honor, right? Which is, again, in some, according to some folks, worse than death. Um, now, considering everything that the drugs had cost him, John promised over and over again over the course of many years to quit the morphine. Uh, and in fact, he got so desperate to do so that he turned to um, medicines that were called patent medicines. These are snake oil medicines. And after the Civil War, there was, for the first time in American history, dozens of different brands of snake oil addiction so-called cures. And I say that with scare quotes because most of these medicines actually had opium in them. So you thought you were being cured, but really it was just keeping you uh, addicted. So John spent hundreds of dollars on these medicines, little to say they did nothing but make the family's financial crisis even worse. So with the tension between John and Fanny mounting, it was increasingly clear to Fanny by 1896 that John wasn't going to be able to quit, that he was probably never going to be able to change. And so one day in February of 1896, everything snapped. Fanny returned home to their Fredericksburg house from an afternoon outing. When she opened the door to walk inside, she saw John slumped over the stairs in what she recognized immediately as a morphine daze. Keep in mind, he had promised to quit. So after years and years and years of John's broken promises, Fanny simply couldn't take it anymore. She had had enough, and so she took the nuclear option, which was divorce. She wanted a divorce, so Fanny ran upstairs uh, and penned this really raw, angry letter to her brother, describing her plan to abandon John and dissolve the marriage. And I'll read you a quote from that letter. You can tell that it's angry, by the way, when you see the manuscript, because Fanny usually has perfect handwriting, but this quote is big. It's in a big bold font, it's underlined, she's upset. And she writes, there is no dependence to be put in John. What can I do? He can do anything if only he could break off this horrible habit, but it seems he can't. Soon John will have gotten over the effects of whatever it is that he took, and then he will beg me and implore me not to do this, not to get a divorce, but I must, I must, for I can neither bear for myself nor our children any longer this life. I am obliged to leave him. Now again, for a society lady in, in 1896 Virginia, this is truly the nuclear option. Divorce was also stigmatized, uh, not to mention the fact that the couple had tried to keep John's uh, addiction secret. So Fanny uh, immediately leaves the house. She flees to Washington, D.C., to the north, uh, refuses to speak to John ever again, penned a series of about 25 angry, scathing letters to relatives all over the country, um, but particularly here in Virginia, saying, you know, my plan is to divorce John. She seized control of the family accounts, she got a divorce lawyer, and she started filling out the paperwork. Um, luckily for John's sake, his brother steps in and manages to talk Fanny down off the ledge, but that raised the question, what do we do with John? Again, remember the Western state lunatic asylum in Stanton. One option was to send him there. Uh, however, this would also be talked about in the papers because being committed to a psychiatric facility then, like now, was deeply stigmatized. So they decided against that, um, and also, of course, they've decided against divorce, finally. So the third, the next best option, and this is going to sound horrible because it was, was to simply lock John in a room, take away all of his morphine, and force him to detox, cold turkey. He would either come out of the room cured, or he would die. And either option at this point was... Uh, uh, okay, I guess, with, with Fanny and the family. And so that's exactly what they did. They sent John to his brother's farmhouse out in the country near Fredericksburg, took everything out of the room. They hired around-the-clock guards and nurses to watch John so that he couldn't somehow ferret out a vial of morphine and take it. 
And the situation stayed like that for a year while they kept John in the room. They write about his screams while he detoxed. Uh, and again, he's lucky to survive the situation because it can actually kill you to detox that way. Um, Fast forward in time, Fanny and John about a year later did reconnect. Uh, she cooled off, they never did get divorced, but to give away the sad ending of this saga and so many other stories like this that I write about in my book, none of this helped. Letters from 1901 and 1910 indicate that John relapsed and began taking morphine again. Eventually, even word about his addiction got out. In 1915, remember Fanny had been the head of a local UDC chapter. She was forced by her chapter to resign specifically because John was addicted to morphine and it was too stigmatized for them to have any association with, with Fanny Gulrick. And I will also add that eventually, uh, I've recently discovered that one of John and Fanny's sons also became addicted to morphine later in life. And so ultimately, you know, what can we make of this story? Uh, the Gorick story, like the broader saga of uh, America's first opioid crisis after the Civil War, was a tragedy. There's, I can see no other way to look at this. Uh, like many Civil War veterans, addiction stalked John Gulrick and Fanny Gulrick until he died in 1926. In fact, his death certificate lists a particular kind of heart disease that has been linked by modern doctors to long-term opioid abuse, and that's myocarditis, which is an opportunistic heart infection that um, you have to be severely immunocompromised yet. So all of that is to say that John, who probably became addicted to opioids as a teenage uh, you know, conscript in Civil War Virginia, spent the majority of his life addicted, and in that process, it cost the Gulricks everything. John's health, his manhood, their happiness, money, and almost their marriage, and maybe even John's life. Um, so when we kind of take a step back and figure out what does this mean for the soldiers' civil war, for those who survived the civil war and went to live on beyond 1865, uh, I will reiterate that oftentimes, until very recently, when historians think about civil war veterans, we often think about these kind of old-timey, sepia-toned photos with, with well-adjusted, happy civil war veterans who have managed to get over the war and leave it behind them. But at least for opioid-addicted Civil War veterans, this was absolutely not the case. And you can imagine also that amputees and other veterans in their situation felt the same as well. So that's all that I have. I'm going to pivot to the Q&A, and I'm happy to talk more about any of this. Thank you. I can hear you. Uh, yeah, I, I've been on, I've been in the sign business 46 years, and in 93, I fell 30 feet and broke my pelvis. And then in 98, I fell 20 feet and broke my back. And I've been on fentanyl patch since the year 2000. Mm -hmm. I was on Oxycontin before that. And they took my Oxycontin, I, get, I went on a fentanyl patch. And I didn't like your fentanyl patch at all. I said, give me my Oxycontin back. But after two days, I, you're not taking your fentanyl patch away, you know. But since then, I've been, like I say, on a fentanyl patch. I'm on the maximum allowable uh, fentanyl and Percocets allowed. I've had to, they, they've cut me back since they, they redid the standards here a couple years. Yeah. And they've cut me back to that. But... I raised four kids who were little when I got my injury. Yeah. I had a wife sick with cancer for three years. I took care of her. I still work every day, you know, and I, like I said, I, I, I've been, it's like a functionality. I mean, it's, it's a standard of living. Mm -hmm. these, these abusers are what? You have a question? No, I was just, this topic hit right on this. Yeah. Uh, but uh, anyways, I was just wanting to throw that in there. It's not all misery. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you for sharing your story first. Um, and I, I think that we can really see the same thing in a lot of cases of, of Civil War veterans as well. Um, when we, uh, when observers looked at people like John, they saw folks that needed to quit the morphine, right? They needed to break the chains of morphine slavery. But if you asked, um, not all, of course, but many Civil War veterans, can you continue on like this? Can you, can you be um, 
you know, quote, functional, they, they said yes, and they insisted on this over and over again. Um, in fact, in my book, I write about this. I wasn't able to talk about it today, but towards the 1890s, there was a wave of sympathy for addicted veterans like John, especially in the North. Um, in the North, there was a more uh, robust public health system, right? And so many of the doctors uh, up in the North that were doing research on uh, kind of the foundations about what we know about addiction were deeply sympathetic to the Civil War veterans that came, came into their hospitals and clinics. So even though it's a national problem, you do start to kind of see this regional um, uh, approach to dealing with Civil War veterans. But again, thank you for sharing your story. Um, what what records um, are you using to do your, are the records of pharmaceutical companies, are there records of uh, Civil War era things? And there's a Gulrick's drugstore in Fredericksburg today. Is that any yes. connection? Is I believe, oh, sorry, go ahead. That's it, that's it. Yeah, I believe, um, I should say I've had no contact with any of the, the subjects in my study, right? Um, when you're writing a, a history about medicine, you have to go through these things called IRBs, and so we, we have to say we've had no contact with the people that we're writing about. But with that said, the Gulrichs are still around. Um, there's still a Gulrichs uh, drugstore in Fredericksburg, and I believe that it's linked to the family that I talked about today. Um, and I can say the same thing for many of the cases in my book. They have living descendants today, um, and at some point when I'm released from the IRB, I would love to know what they, what they, they think about this, this history. Um, as far as sources go, when I kind of launched into this project, uh, it, was, was it was in like 2014, 2015, before I was really aware of the opioid crisis. I was kind of naive about it. I had my head in the books, basically, and not in the news. Um, and so I expected that this would be a topic that there would either be so few cases of or that people would be unwilling to write down you know, their experiences, that I would have a hard time finding sources. But I have found the opposite. I am drowning in sources, uh, almost so many that I can't process them all, which has been a welcome treat for a historian. Um, some of the main sources that I use are Civil War pension records. Um, you could, in the, in the Union, uh, you know, in the US government, the federal pension system, uh, eventually regulations were put in place that specifically barred uh, opium eaters from receiving pensions. However, many, many men still tried, right? And so they disclosed their addictions. They specifically linked them to Civil War medical care. Uh, like Perry Bowser, the story that I told of the guy that gets addicted in a Vicksburg hospital and then goes and applies for a pension, gets rejected, and then goes and successfully manages to get into a soldier's home. Um, his case illustrates how you can, you can find these cases in Civil War pension records. Uh, you can also find them in the, the medical records of soldiers' homes. Uh, again, the, the soldiers' home system after the Civil War, that was kind of like the first iteration of, of uh, the, the VA that kind of develops in the 1880s and 90s, um, spanned the country. And in these places, they poked and prodded and wrote down everything that they saw about Civil War veterans. So naturally, there were thousands of, of addicted Civil War veterans that ended up in these facilities, and their records have been uh, a key source for me as well. Um, I'll go back a couple slides and show you another fun source. This is actually going to be the topic of my second book project, which is about medical fraud in the Civil War era. Uh, newspapers have been a prolific source for me, and that's because of these snake oil cures, uh, cures that were developed kind of by entrepreneurial uh, self-styled doctors uh, after the Civil War to treat addicted veterans like John. There was, for the first time, so many addicted people after the Civil War that it was enough to sustain an industry like this, an addiction cure industry. And so that's why we see the first rehabs, but also the first uh, patent medicines ever that were specifically designed to cure op opioid addiction. So those are just some of the sources. Obviously, Fan and, uh, I, I will also say that Fannie and John's uh, exchange of letters, um, which lives here in Richmond at the Virginia Historical Society, has also been really helpful for me, too. Thank you. Dr. Jones, I have a question from the online audience. Yes. What was the relationship of John Gulrick with Colonel Chester Gulrick, longtime history professor at VMI? That is a, an interest. It's funny that you mention it, right? <laughs> um, I have been, I have only recently realized that there's actually a file on the Gulrick family down the, you know, a football field away from my office at Virginia Military Institute. So I have not, I don't fully know the details of that relationship. I have learned that uh, one of John Gulrick's, John and Fanny's sons, was a cadet at Virginia Military Institute. So the next thing on my list is to walk down, uh, you know, the main avenue on post and uh, dig into that file. So stay tuned. Uh, yes. The, the oh, yeah. um, uh, 
I was uh, fascinating talk, but I was interested in um, where they <clears throat> where they ultimately got the opium from. Yeah. Were there a bunch of people on the street corners that were selling stuff, or was it truly the local pharmacy that was was providing all of this opium? Yeah, there we we have this kind of mindset about um, uh, you know. Uh, prescription medicines today versus, um, you know, illicit substances, right? And back then, that distinction did not exist because there were no drug laws uh, in the 19th century. So in the Civil War era, if you wanted to buy a year's worth of morphine, all you had to do was take your cash and plunk it down on uh, the, uh, you know, the counter of a drugstore. Um, you could buy them uh, from local drugstores like the ones in Stanton, Virginia. Um, towards the 1880s and 90s, when you start to see the rise of the first department stores in the U.S., you could send a check to Sears and Roebuck off in Chicago, and they would, a couple months later, you would receive in the mail a vial of morphine with two syringes, just for $1.50. Um, so these medicines truly were freely flowing. They were everywhere. Uh, I'll also say that doctors would usually keep their own stockpile of, of opium on hand to prescribe to their patients. So uh, self-medication and prescriptions both factor in here. Jonathan, I'm interested in your background. Do you have a medical background, or has this been a learning experience for you? I have, uh, so, so I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not that kind of doctor. <laughs> um, but I have always been interested in, in medicine and science. And so um, for, for a while, when I was in high school and, and in uh, my undergraduate studies, I thought I might want to become a surgeon. Um, and so what I didn't realize at that time was that I was obsessed with history as well. And so when I realized that there was such a thing as not just Civil War history, but medical history of, of the Civil War, that's when I knew you know, what I had to do. Uh, and so, um, again, I'm, I'm not a medical doctor, but uh, I do have some background in, in science um, just through the various part of my uh, education. Uh, and I'm obsessed with medical history as well. The, the nice thing I'll also say for anybody else, else out there that's kind of morbidly curious about the gross stuff of the Civil War era, 19th century medicine is surprisingly easy to understand. It's much less complicated than uh, modern, you know, 21st century medicine. Um, so it's, it's easier to kind of immerse yourself into it without a medical science degree, which has been good for me, right? Oh, great. Opioid problem today. Um, but, but I know that aside from Western State, there were other schools and medical institutions. Yeah. Was that why Stanton was the opium city of the valley, or was there some other reason? You know, that's a good question. I think, I think uh, so, so I, I referenced this newspaper story in 1878 about Stanton that, that labeled Stanton the great opium city of, of the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, part of that is because Stanton at that time was a railway junction, and so um, opium, uh, when it would be shipped into Virginia from elsewhere, right? A lot of times it would collect at these railway hubs. And so as best I can reason, the opium's coming into Stanton, people from out in the valley, like the rural parts of, of the valley, go to Stanton to do their shopping. And so that's why they're, they're buying opium there. Also, the, the New York Times, um, that piece in 1878, that story noted that a lot of the opium was being consumed at Western State Asylum, right? Because these are facilities where um, kind of modern, uh, surprisingly, where kind of modern rehab practices were invented. Um, today, in a lot of rehabs, uh, folks are slowly tapered down off of opioids. That's exactly what they did at Western State in the 1870s and 1880s. And so they needed a, a good degree of opium uh, at these facilities as well. So it's a bit of both. It's, it's, it's a small world, right? And I never, when I started off on this project, I had no idea that I would end up in Lexington, Virginia at VMI, right? So I didn't intend for this to be a Shenandoah Valley kind of close to home history, but it, it, it's kind of morphed into that, which has been fun in a dark way. Yes. Oh.